Good morning from Melbourne. Uh, good afternoon to the US. Uh, we are super delighted to have Timur Kuran with us today. And we will be speaking about a joint paper he has with Asle Chansanur from uh, Cambridge, uh, sorry, Oxford University. And uh, the paper we will be talking about is entitled Economic Harbingers of Political Modernization, Peaceful Explosion of Rights in Ottoman Istanbul. And to get the stage set, I thought that you could maybe say a few words about transitions uh, in general between political regimes and why they are often violent and sometimes peaceful. So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me on this uh, uh, program. I'm uh, uh, very honored and I should point out that my co-author, uh, Asle, is uh, now an assistant professor at the University of Washington. She completed her uh, three-year postdoc at uh, Oxford. So to come to your question, uh, peaceful transitions occur uh, through negotiations among elites. They come through acts from above not uprisings by masses, which is the pattern we see often with violent regime changes. With peaceful transitions, three conditions are usually present. Elites of the old regime expect a net gain from the transition. Secondly, the New Deal is credible. The old regime's elites have good reason to believe that the new regime will enforce the promised rights. And thirdly, the de jure reforms have been underway de facto, and sometimes for decades, if not centuries. The new agreement legitimizes trends that have been underway for some, some time. Now, regime changes in the Ottoman Empire had occurred, the most consequential before 1839 uh, was the Ottoman state's transition in the early 1400s from a principality that was on the edges of the Eastern Roman Empire to a new empire of its own. The Ottoman, during this transition, the Ottoman dynasty voided some old alliances and it created new ones. This was a very bloody affair that involved uh, uh, many battles, many uh, relatives fighting each other, the dynasty uh, uh, dividing into factions. There was violent resistance from various quarters that lasted uh, many years. In later centuries, certain sultans tried to curtail the privileges of certain groups. Repeatedly, they failed. One reformist sultan was executed in the early 1600s, Four others were deposed. There were several that, who did manage to keep their throne, but they, did, they, they uh, stayed in power only by shelving initiatives, abandoning reforms, and scapegoating close associates, essentially feeding them to the mutineers for uh, execution. So uh, certain conditions have to be present for uh, the ones that I mentioned, for uh, transitions to be uh, uh, peaceful. Otherwise, you will get major resistance. Um, you look at one particular regime, um, particular regime transition that stands out from your paper, the Gulhain Edict of 1839. What made it so important historically and what led to it? So the, the Gulhane Edict broke with the past in three fundamental respects. The Ottoman dynasty had been ruling since 1299. And in 1839, in other words, five and a half centuries later, it made three momentous changes to how it would govern. Now, until then, Muslims had legal privileges that were denied to Christians and Jews. Officially, under the law, Muslims were first-class citizens, 
Christians and Jews were second class, they were subordinate. Now with this edict, the three groups would be equal before the law. Now, what exactly was meant by equality before the law? Of course, this was controversial from the start, and this is unsurprising. The US passed the Civil Rights Act in uh, the 1960s. Six decades later, Americans are still debating what racial equality really means in, in practice. So it didn't, uh, in the Ottoman case also, what equality uh, across uh, the various sectarian groups meant. This was, of course, debated uh, until the end of the, the empire. Second, the second big change is that until 1839, the Ottoman population was divided between officials who were exempt from taxation and commoners who were required to pay taxes. Now, everyone was going to pay taxes. And thirdly, until 1839, the Sultan was legally entitled to expropriate at will. With this edict, he gave up that right. Now, the standard explanation for the edict is this. It was a response to foreign pressures, primarily pressure from uh, Britain and uh, France, but also other European uh, states, and steady advice from Europhilic Ottoman leaders, typically uh, Ottoman leaders who had served as ambassador in Vienna and London and uh, so on, and who were very impressed by what they, uh, what they saw. The Sultan, this is the explanation, standard explanation, the Sultan was being advised to imitate European ways, and that's what he did in 1839. Now, this common understanding doesn't explain the timing of the edict or its peaceful reception, which is amazing when you think of the momentous changes it's introducing all at once. Now, what the traditional explanation misses is that the edict was preceded by a century of massive economic redistribution and in the economic instruments available for becoming wealthy, for making money. Our claim in this paper is that the edict was a renegotiation aimed at recognizing new realities, but also making available new opportunities to groups that were not benefiting adequately by institutional changes. Prior developments had already transformed interactions among groups with different legal rights. New constituencies had emerged that would naturally favor the reforms that actually emerged through the, that were put in place, put in motion through the Gulana Edict. That's why the momentous changes could be made peacefully. So what happened in the period leading up to 1839? Massive wealth shifted over more than a century from Islamic trusts called waqfs to securitized businesses. The shares of the businesses uh, were called gidiks and they were tradable. Gidiks were traded in a decentralized way. There was no formal stock market that recorded all transactions as you found in, in uh, Amsterdam or uh, London, courts recorded share sales and changes in ownership. Uh, uh, but there, there were, of course, hundreds, thousands of courts across the empire. It's just difficult to uh, track. The shares, though, were very profitable, and they were held very disproportionately by Christians, who in Istanbul were approximately 40% of the population. Now, why did Christians dominate this equity market, what and what explains their rising prosperity? These answers lie in an international development. The Ottomans were at war with Russia throughout the 1700s, and Russians started promoting Greeks and Armenians and other Orthodox groups that were numerically less significant as part of a strategy of weakening the Ottoman Empire from within. 
and a milestone, now this process started in the early 1700s, but a milestone was reached in 1774 through a treaty that ended a war that the, the Ottomans lost badly. The treaty gave Russians the formal right to protect Ottoman uh, Christians, specifically Orthodox Ottoman Christians, and before long, Britain was protesting, uh, protecting Protestant uh, Ottomans, and France was protecting Catholics, all of which Christians were uh, protected. This is relevant here because remember, pre-1839, the Sultan could confiscate property at will. Now Ottoman rulers would think twice before confiscating Christian property. Through the treaty, Greeks, Greek and Armenian property rights became stronger than Muslim and Jewish property rights. Now, meanwhile, long-term investments used almost exclusively by Muslims, going back to the beginning of, uh, of the Ottoman Empire, and in fact, before the Ottoman Empire and other Muslim-ruled uh, uh, Muslim uh, uh, empires. Uh, Muslim elites had been investing heavily in waqfs, Waqfs were considered sacred, which traditionally protected their assets from the Sultan. That's why wealthy Muslims used them as wealth shelters. But the wealth in them could not be reallocated, at least not easily. So Waqfs formed secure but inflexible forms of wealth. Historically, when the Sultan needed more resources in a hurry, which of course could happen to any ruler, he would confiscate private property and he had a right to do so. Generally, he would not touch rock assets because he did not want to develop a reputation for impiety. But in the 1700s, as military expenses rose, waqfs lost their security. Sultans in desperation started to nationalize waqfs as well. So the expected returns on waqfs relative to gedeks, not high to begin with, kept falling further. Alas, the families controlling these waqfs, very overwhelmingly disproportionately Muslim, they were not free to dissolve these waqfs and move their capital elsewhere into the profit, of, uh, for example, into the profitable equity market. A waqf was formed in perpetuity. The courts wouldn't allow it. And because Muslim elites had weak private property rights, gedeks were not a good option. If a Muslim invested in, in, in gedeks, uh, his or her wealth could be confiscated, at least confiscated with greater probability than if he or she invest, invested in works. So Muslims did not have the security that Christians enjoyed through foreign protection. So to sum up, there was massive wealth distribution prior to 1839. Wealth distribution across forms of wealth from trusts to the stock market and across religious groups toward Christians. The edict was a response to the problems of Muslim elites and Christians demand for equality under the law. Amazing. Um, I just wonder, you mentioned so many players. At the end of the day, who gained and who lost? Very good question. Uh, on the face of it, Muslims and elites were big losers. When you just read the text of the, of the edict, they gave up big privileges, right? Muslims were privileged. Uh, and they gave up those privileges. The uh, uh, elites didn't pay taxes. They have to pay taxes. Uh, now the Sultan might seem a loser. He gave up expropriation rights. But the losers weren't net losers. They gained something. Each of them gained something more valuable than what they gave up. Muslim elites were politically very powerful. They remained in charge of the, uh, the political system in 1839, but they lacked economically important rights that wealthy Christians enjoyed. They lacked property rights, secure property rights. 
that private property was insecure and your, your private property was uh, not terribly insecure if you were a very poor person, but if you were well, a wealthy person and elites were, were wealthy, uh, you had wealth that stood out, that was uh, accessible to the, the, the Sultan saw uh, and uh, could expropriate. So the, and, and uh, so in addition, the rise of a very profitable equity market had produced a demonstration effect. Elite Muslims saw in the course of the 1700s and early 1800s, they saw the advantages of general property rights, which is what Christians enjoyed, and of the ability to invest in new and very profitable markets. That required getting the Sultan to promise not to confiscate their private wealth. Now, the Sultan himself, what did he gain from this? He saw, again, and it wasn't just the Sultan who proclaimed this, but that Sultan's his predecessor and the predecessor, and, and even the, uh, the uh, uh, even the one earlier, uh, the one was ruling at the beginning of the uh, 19th century, they saw the advantages of wealth creation by investors who felt secure. They had something to gain from extending property rights to the general population. The Ottoman Empire, like other non-Western empires, including uh, China, had low fiscal capacity. The, the sultans, the Ottoman dynasty, sensed that they would be better off if they let Muslims, more than half of their, their subjects, create new wealth following the examples of Christians whom they had been taxing. Sultans could, they, they would be giving up their right to expropriate, but they would be able to tax new wealth. And the expectation was that the so much more new wealth would be created that this would be this would uh, uh, ultimately make it profitable to give up the confiscation rights. So uh, uh, this was the Sultan's calculation. His empire's fiscal capacity would go up. When his fiscal capacity went up, he could finance reforms. He could modernize his military. He would stop losing territories. He would catch up economically with Western powers. He would, he would actually save uh, his empire. Christians were major players by then because of their wealth. They were tired of being treated as second-class citizens. They wanted political power and social status to match their economic clout. The Jews also gained. In Istanbul, they were uh, about 7% of the population. They had weak property rights because no foreign power was protecting them. The various Christian denominations were protected, were being protected, but nobody was protecting uh, Jews. Now they could press prosper. And in fact, after the Gunana Edict, they started catching up quite rapidly with, uh, with Christians as the century uh, wore on. And uh, by the beginning of the 20th century, they were, uh, they were quite uh, uh, prominent in, in business, something that was not the case at the time of the Gulhan uh, Edict. Were there losers? Well, clerics were losers, but uh, uh, they had a great stake in uh, the walks. They supervised the walks and collected rents from walks. They owned many of the surviving uh, walks, but their political power was greatly uh, diminished because the amount of wealth held by these trusts called walks had diminished. So the wealth that they supervised had, uh, had was much, much smaller. They could not stop the reforms as they had again and again. They were part of the conservative coalitions that stopped earlier attempts at reforms by, uh, by, by other uh, sultans. None of them had tried anything as ambitious, but they had tried to take away certain privileges from Muslim elites and so on. 
they were blocked every single time by uh, sultans. So uh, this also gives uh, provides an explanation for the timing question. The sultans had to wait until clerics weakened enough. It wasn't enough to that there were there, there would be many uh, gainers, but the opposition had to uh, uh, weaken. Most people uh, gained uh, from uh, the edict, uh, and that's why there were massive celebrations around the empire when the edict was proclaimed, and the celebrations brought together elites and commoners, Muslims, Christians, and uh, Jews. They all felt that uh, the greater property rights and quality would uh, improve uh, their economic lot and give them greater freedoms. Wonderful. Uh, I, I'm just curious about uh, what is the data source for all of that? Because you can't just walk into the statistical office of Turkey today and on the shelf there is uh, some well statistics from the 18th and 19th century, but it must have been super hard work in, in archives. Um, uh, yes, ab absolutely. Uh, Asla and I, uh, for this paper, used the records of Istanbul courts from 1600 to 1839 for most uh, cases, and for some purposes from 1453 to 1923 in a new, new draft of the paper that, that uh, we're about to finish. The year, of course, 1453 is the year that Constantinople became Istanbul, and 1923 is the final founding of the Turkish uh, uh, Republic. Uh, these Islamic courts adjudicated disputes, and the facts of the case were recorded in court registers and saved at uh, in storerooms of mosques. And in the, in the late 19th century, these were all collected from all over the empire and archive was uh, uh, formed. There are tens of thousands of these uh, uh, registers from around the empire. Uh, now, uh, the Islamic courts not only uh, adjudicated uh, disputes, but they served as notaries. People of all walks of life had commercial contracts uh, registered in these courts, and the contracts were uh, were put in them. Copies were given to the to the parties. They were available in the court records for anybody to uh, come and uh, see. Uh, these, as uh, in their capacity of uh, as as notaries. Uh, the courts also reported business settlements, uh, estate settlements to avoid future disputes. Now, uh, I had started collecting this data in 2004 to see whether economic institutions changed across the 1600s. Now, my, what I was interested in is seeing, I was interested in, in looking across the 1600s a time when there were major institutional changes in Europe to see whether I could find any parallels here. And the main finding was in the 17th, uh, in the 17th century, they did not. You found the same types of contracts in the, uh, at the end of the 17th century as you did in, in the beginning. Uh, the data coll collection though has continued. We now have a data set that runs from 1600 all the way to the 1860s, this is a quarter millennium. As this paper with Asla John Sunar shows, massive changes occurred, institutional changes occurred in the 1700s and early 1800s, and the transformations didn't exactly track those in Europe. They have analogs in Europe, but they're different. The stock market that emerged in an environment uh, in an Islamic environment, in a society governed under Islamic law was different from the stock markets that emerged in Europe. A big difference was, uh, is that in Europe you had, uh, uh, you had a law of corporations, 
uh, the Middle East didn't get such a law, didn't allow corporations, at least legally, until the beginning of the 20th century. Now, these records are all housed at a public archive in Istanbul. Uh, that, that's a raw data, of course. We chose, uh, going back to 2004, we, uh, we chose two commercially important courts. There were more than 20 courts in Istanbul. We chose the commercially most important ones because we were, we were interested in economic transactions. We wanted to see what was happening you know, with, with, in, with the wealthiest uh, uh, people, how they invested, how they did business, what types of contracts they used. And moving ahead in time, we've been choosing registers randomly to give us a uniform distribution of cases for each of these courts uh, over time. So this, the, the data collection, uh, uh, the data collection continues. Yes, it's it's uh, not uh, easy. Uh, we fortunately we do have uh, a list online of all of the registers in this uh, public archive. All of those for Istanbul are in one place, which makes it uh, relatively easy. One thing that's difficult is, of course, that sometimes you get a, a register and. Uh, uh, rats have eaten corners of it, so you have to, uh, you can't really use it because you don't have all the information on cases and you have to switch, uh, uh, switch registers, uh, uh, but uh, uh, this is a relatively minor problem for other cities. Uh, one has to, from some other cities, some of the registers are uh, in, in Turkey, some of them are in Greece or Bulgaria or Syria or, uh, or Egypt, so uh, it's a little bit more difficult. You have to deal with multiple uh, archives, and some of the countries are not as organized. They still haven't centralized all of the, uh, uh, or, or digitized these, uh, uh, these records. Well, you, you just mentioned what are the challenges uh, to work in archives. Um, I'm sure there's many others. Feel free to list them. But I'm also curious about what do you find exciting about this um, archival uh, data work? So, so let me start with the, with the latter. The archives uh, contain so much information and those of the Ottoman Empire have barely been studied systematically by economic and political historians. Uh, there's geographic information in these uh, records. There's information about social status, who is trading with whom, the trajectory of the housing market, who used courts, and so much, so much more. Now, if you, if you code the court data patiently, you can uncover patterns that scholars just looking at the records can easily miss. Let me just give you one example. Ottomanists widely have believed that Islamic courts treated commoners and non-Muslims fairly, which was a puzzle because under the law, commoners do not have the rights of elites and non-Muslims do not have the rights of, uh, of Muslims. And in fact, uh, judges in their training, they're taught to treat Muslim testimony as stronger than Christian testimony. Male uh, testimony is stronger than female testimony. Browsing the data, it's easy to get the impression that they're, that they're treating uh, all sides fairly because these groups, the legally inferior groups, win many trials against privileged groups. You see Muslims, uh, uh, Christians winning in trials against uh, Muslims, uh, commoners winning against state officials. Uh, in fact, there's a big selection bias in which, which disputes get adjudicated. The weaker parties sued the powerful disproportionately less, which suggests there's a selection bias in what dispute, which disputes went to trial. The weak sued the powerful only when their case was very strong. And this is something that 
with uh, student, former student Scott Lustig, uh, I was able to uh, uh, to show uh, the, uh, the cases that uh, go to court when, um, for example, the, a non-Muslim suing uh, suing a Muslim, the uh, a Christian very frequently has a court document that proves the case beyond any doubt, and uh, so this is this is what we are uh, uh, observing. Now, uh, to come to the, uh, and, and these types of, of findings are uh, tremendously exciting when you actually, uh, when you actually notice puzzles that have remained unresolved for a long time. And by looking at, at the data, you're able to come up with an explanation and the puzzle disappears. Now, not everything you might want is recorded in the registers. This comes, uh, goes to the first part of your question. Uh, as with other historical research, there's often no way to get it. The desired information is just lost uh, uh, forever. In credit contracts, it would be useful to have both the lender's location and the borrower's location. But usually, unfortunately, the registers give only the neighborhood of the borrower. And the logic is obvious. The lender wants to know where he or she can find the, uh, the borrower in case uh, uh, the borrower doesn't repay. But the borrower, having received the money, will not necessarily have a need to uh, find the lender. If the borrower cannot find the, the lender, all that happens is that uh, the borrower keeps the money. So it's the, it's the lender's uh, uh, problem. So this is, this is very unfortunate because there are many things, if we, if we had the locations of both, there are many types of questions we could, uh, uh, we could address. Wow. Uh political and economic history as a detective really going to the archives sticking out stuff making inference and so on so is that what you always uh, wanted to do when you were young or uh, how did you become a social scientist well uh no i mean I, as as uh growing up i had not imagined that i would be doing what i'm doing now i i was always interested as a teenager in social issues and, and history. And uh, my father was a professor, a, like the historian of architecture. One of my uncles was a historian. We, uh, growing up, uh, I uh, knew many academics who would come home and discuss uh, social affairs and history. And I was always very interested in this. I read my, myself, but I had no clue about how you would study these types of issues systematically. So as a college freshman, I intended to study chemical engineering, maybe chemistry. And in my first semester, I took the types of courses, you know, physics, chemistry, uh, uh, math, and so on, the, uh, the tip, uh, person on that track takes. But I also took Economics 101 as an elective because my advisor, who was a chemistry professor, said, it still rings in my ears, no matter what you do in life, knowing economics will serve you well. So I took Econ 101 as a first semester freshman. And this was, turned out to be terrific advice. My TA in Economics 101 was an advanced PhD student named Oliver Hart. Now he's, of course, uh, famous economist. Uh, he was a wonderfully entertaining uh, TA. Uh, early in the semester, in a weekly quiz, Hart, Hart asked a short question. And it was something like, the government should build a post office within 50 miles, it might have been 30 miles, I can't exactly remember, of every citizen comment. Now, in my answer, I argued on grounds of fairness, on grounds of 
social justice, that the government has a duty to build a post office near everyone. Hart didn't like that answer at all. My quiz came back with a huge zero in red, and he explained that I had failed to understand two concepts already introduced in the course, incentives and trade-offs. And if the government, and then that we discussed in, in class, if the government takes services to every mountaintop, individuals will have no reason to avoid settling places where service delivery is expensive and building a, a post office on a, uh, on a mountain range will reduce resources available for other services. Uh, services, resources aren't infinite. Trade-offs are inevitable. Better put scarce resources into hospitals that will save thousands of lives. Now, this, this sounds just, just trivial, right? But looking back, I see that that was an aha moment for me. What I learned by failing that quiz became a defining moment in my life. Some switch just went on in my mind and I started benefiting from the powerful logic of, of economics. And that experience put me on a path to becoming an economics major and eventually, of course, an economics uh, professor, but it also made me start applying economic logic to areas that were still untouched by economics. And I drove my friends and even, even members of my family crazy by, uh, by bringing incentives and trade-offs into, uh, into argument. The work that we've talked about really falls into this category. This is, a, this is an area that at, at the time when I was taking Economics 101 was not touched by uh, economics and uh, work on Islamic law and effective uh, of uh, uh, Islamic institutions were studied primarily by religion scholars, traditional uh, historians, and uh, as you can see in my work, incentives and uh, trade-offs are everywhere. Wonderful. Wow. Life has its uh, bends and turns and twists. Amazing. Um, now, you, you are the world's best known scholar when it comes to Islam and economic performance, really. And you had a recent uh, piece in Journal of Economic Literature that uh, I'm a big fan of. And uh, maybe you want to talk more generally about what excites you these days and uh, what maybe you yourself consider your most important piece of work in the past. So uh, let me say, say generally about, uh, since you brought up that, uh, uh, Journal of Economic Literature uh, piece on Islam and economic performance uh, uh, in area studies, but also in various disciplines, there have been many sterile debates about the roles of religion. There are scholars who say that certain religious institutions had positive effects or, or that they had negative effects. They generally treat these institutions and therefore the effects is, as fixed. And you have other scholars who are arguing against them, who ignore religion as an epic phenomenon, a structure that merely reflects deeper patterns or uh, trends. Economic research on religion in general, and also Islam, of course, has contributed to making these long and steady deba debates much more uh, fr fruitful. Religious institutions have their own dynamics. They're affected by other institutions, but they also shape sectors we consider non-religious. They constrain what can be done in other sectors, sectors we can say and we consider uh, non-religious. Effects go both ways. Religions are sometimes static, but they can be very dynamic as well. We see this in Islam, we see this in Christianity, we see this in other uh, religions, we see it in Judaism. But the cases of stability uh, can be explained through economic tools. We can, we can explain why equilibria, social equilibria arise that, uh, uh, that prevent uh, change. Cases of transformation, doing rapid transformation like that in the Ottoman Empire in the uh, in the uh, uh, 19th century, this can be explained through economic tools. The paper that we have uh, just discussed 
it's of course one component of that explanation, but there's more to it. There's after the edict, there were many, many reforms. Many Islamic institutions were abandoned, sometimes in stages, sometimes very abruptly replaced uh, by European equivalents. For, ex for example, the Gedit market was uh, abandoned in favor of European style uh, stock markets. And uh, so I find this uh, where this work in uh, religion and economic development, I find this very uh, exciting. There are many people who are, many others who are uh, contributing to it. And I think there will be major, major advances in years to, uh, to come. Now, in Middle East studies or uh, Islamic studies, these are, of course, overlapping areas. Uh, uh, a big question has always been whether Islam has helped or hindered development. There have been periods when we look, uh, look back at the last uh, 100 uh, uh, years or so, we see periods when the question became politically incorrect to even, uh, even ask, but it, of course it's a big question and it, uh, it resurfaces. No categorical answer is correct in, in uh, my view. For many centuries, Islamic institutions helped to make the Middle East a prosperous part of the globe. Uh, only China might have been uh, richer. Those same institutions, because they did not evolve or because they evolved in ways that proved to be less productive over the long run than European transformations, they turned the Middle East into an underdeveloped area. Many economists and political scientists are now un uncovering the complexities of Middle Eastern history using the methods of institutional uh, political economy and of course modern uh, empirical techniques. Uh, the joint uh, Jansunar Quran paper we talked about is for me part of uh, a research agenda to understand the mechanisms that uh, turn the Middle East into a chronically underdeveloped part of the world, both economically and uh, politically. The economic part of the puzzle was, was addressed in my book The Long Divergence and many associated uh, articles, but also very fine works by uh, others. And I won't mention anybody because if I mentioned three, I would, uh, uh, it would be unfair to uh, the ones I, I don't. Uh, there are some very fine scholars doing good, good work. The political puzzle, uh, which is that the Middle East is today the world's most repressive region least democratic region. It had a single democracy until last year, Tunisia, and even, even that is uh, now an autocracy. Uh, this political puzzle is getting attention from many scholars. I myself am in the process of completing a book on the political legacies of uh, Islamic law. Uh, I'm hoping it will contribute to the debate on the on chronic political repression in, in the Middle East. And this will, in a sense, be a, a, a complete some missing parts of uh, the long divergence. And that was deliberate. That project started as uh, one that would explain both economic and political underdevelopment in one volume. And I soon realized that uh, I'd end up with an 800, 900 page book, which would become a doorstopper and uh, nothing else. So I actually split it. But anyway, I'm working on the political uh, part of it now. Yeah, wonderful. So maybe one day we should have you back and have you talk about the book, uh, because that sounds uh, super exciting how uh, periods where we have democracies uh, turned back into autocracies and what happens there. So thank you so much, Timo. That was amazing. Uh, our last podcast of the year 2021 and a very enjoyable one indeed. And uh, thanks for your time and uh, hope to see you also face to face before too long. 
Yes, I hope so too. So thanks to you and thanks to Marco again for the invitation and for uh, uh, the very stimulating uh, uh, questions. And as to being re-invited, it's really up to you. You know, you know where to, you know, know where you, you know where to find me. And uh, my book, I hope, will be uh, will be done in a in a few months and probably out in a year. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Bye bye. Amazing. Bye bye. Thank you so Thank much. You. I'll see you in the next one in 2022. Bye. Yeah.